Well, it is now 1 p.m. Eastern. So once again, hello and welcome to the spring edition of the Insights and Innovations webinar series hosted by the International District Energy Association. My name is Scott Seicher and I serve as the membership manager for the association. Today's webinar is titled, Blue is the New Green, How One Hydrogen Boiler is Changing District Energy, presented by Hydrogen Technologies Incorporated. Before we get to the specifics of the presentation, I'd like to go over just a few housekeeping notes. This webinar is scheduled for one hour, including the presentation and approximately 15 minutes for question and answers. But we can run as late as 2.20 Eastern time if we get enough questions. This webinar will be recorded and streamed on the IDEA website within 24 hours of the conclusion of this webinar. Registrants will also be sent a follow-up email with links to the recording and presentation slides. A link to the presentation slides will be provided in the chat box if you want to print that out and follow along. Please submit questions via the Q&A box during the presentation portion of the webinar. The Q&A icon can be found in the menu bar at the bottom of your screen. Questions will be reviewed by IDEA and posed to the presenters by the host at the conclusion of their presentation. Finally, if you're having audio or video issues, please send a note in the chat function to our host, Jason Beal. Now on to the webinar. As mentioned previously, today's webinar is focused on an innovative technology concerning the use of hydrogen in district energy systems. It will help you understand the benefits of zero emission hydrogen boilers, why hydrogen may become an even more attractive fuel source as carbon taxes proliferate, and most importantly, why advances in hydrogen combustion technology offer great promise for district energy system owners and operators. Our presenters today are Janet Reiser and Dean Moriton. Ms. Reiser currently serves as the president of Hydrogen Technologies Incorporated. Educated as a chemical engineer, she is an experienced policymaker, senior executive, and program manager with over 35 years of experience in energy management, engineering, construction, and telecommunications, most recently running the governmental Alaska Energy Authority. Dean Moriton, which, who is a officer of Hydrogen Technologies Incorporated, is an electrical engineer with 33 years of experience in energy businesses operations for physical and financial energy projects spanning 34 countries. He has extensive expertise with financial modeling, business risk mitigation, and optimization of economic variables. Mr. Morton's expertise includes analysis and design of combined heat and power solutions, microgrids, renewable energy solutions, and, secure, and securing government funding. He, is, uh, he currently also ser serves as a board member on a US utility and on an investment group. So without further ado, we will turn things over to the presenters. Take it away, Janet and Dean. Thank you, Scott. And thank you for attendees for joining us on this discussion of our greenhouse gas-free hydrogen powered boiler. And how our plain is the new green for district energy. On this agenda, uh, we'll be introducing the hydrogen boiler. We'll explain how the device works and its unique features. We'll touch on some of the boiler comparisons, review where the hydrogen market exists today, where it's going and how fast it'll get there. Uh, we'll look at the government forces driving these kind of investments and the uh, rapidly expanding technologies around it. We'll look at uh, how the hydrogen boiler may fit into your operation and conclude with a roadmap of how to move your greenhouse, green, or greenhouse gas emissions closer to zero. So now I'll pass it over to Janet for the next slide. Well, thank you all. And again, I, I extend my welcome as well. Um, we're excited to make our presentation today. We use the term blue as the new green, even though we know that hydrogen, when it burns or combusts with oxygen, produces no color flame. It's the blue comes from sulfur, but it's gotten the moniker that it's the blue flame. So that's where the name comes from. I included a few things on this slide to talk a little bit about hydrogen. And um, you know, I think that you, if you're on this call or on this webinar, you're pretty much familiar with hydrogen. But some of the things that are germane to how we use the hydrogen um, and some you know, to anticipate some questions. I think people know, generally speaking, that it's a very highly flammable gas. It is a gas at ambient temperatures. It's on its own, it's not toxic, it's not reactive. It is when you put hydrogen and oxygen together 
um, and ignite it, that you produce a tremendous amount of energy. Um, so one of the things that is really important to us is that energy and capturing that energy of reaction, that exothermic energy. Um, you take a look at hydrogen and oxygen, and it's very interesting because when they, when they combust or they burn, they primarily burn in the UV spectrum and not in the IR. So you have some interesting metallurgy um, because that temperature of combustion, while it's 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit, um, it's very, it, it isn't radiant heat. So you don't have a lot of uh, heat other than right internally to the flame. So um, with that, I'll go to the next slide. And this is just some basic chemistry. Um, other presentations I've given people say, can we start with the basics? So basically, we have uh, two hydrogen molecules and oxygen molecule. And the predominant reaction in a combustion reaction between hydrogen and oxygen is to make water. Uh, you can make other components, but those are higher energy components and they generally transfer to the lower energy state. Basically, we are using that in our boiler, the, the hydrogen and oxygen combusting together and releasing a tremendous amount of energy. It's about 140 kilojoules per kilogram of hydrogen. So there's a lot of energy released and we're capturing that on the tube side of a heat exchanger. So let's go to the next slide and I'll talk a little bit about how our boiler works. Uh, this is a basic schematic of our boiler. There are a couple of things you'll, if you're familiar with boilers, you'll notice that are missing from a traditional natural gas boiler. But let me point out the features here. Um, it's a traditional boiler in the sense that we have a burner section and a heat transfer section. Uh, we have oxygen and hydrogen uh, that are the fuels, and that's only fuel. Uh, the thing that you will notice that we do not have that you'll see in other um, uh, boilers is that we do not introduce atmospheric air. That is not where we get our oxygen from for combustion. So without introducing, ox without introducing atmospheric air, we do not have any GHG uh, produced. We don't have NOx, we don't have SOx, uh, we don't have carbon because we don't introduce any, there are none in the system. So not only do we uh, produce steam that uh, are not only not producing emissions, we do not have to vent those emissions. And typically you'd have flue gas and the flue gas would contain those emissions that you'd either clean up or you would manage. Um, we don't have that, and so not only we don't have to clean, we have low emissions, we have zero emissions, but we also don't lose a lot of that heat of reaction to uh, a flu stream. So typically we have a steam condensing, it's fundamentally a steam condensing uh, tube fired boiler. So the hydrogen and oxygen react um, separately. We introduce the hydrogen and oxygen separately, they react after um, introduction into the chamber with a small spark, they are then superheated steam, attenuated and attemperated, and then into the tube side of the heat exchange part of the boiler. Um, they condense and then come out of the boiler as water. And that water, if you're using electrolysis uh, to get your hydrogen and oxygen in the first place, that can be recycled back to the electrolyzer. So, um, in the case of using an electrolyzer, the need for very pure water is a one-time need. We're able to recirculate that back with very little makeup water because the hydrogen and oxygen combined in stoichiometric ratios produce our water that we can cycle back to the um, uh, electrolyzer to be re-split into hydrogen and oxygen. If electrolyzer is not the option, if it's more trucked in or, or, or tanked in um, boiler, we, um, hydrogen and oxygen, we can take that uh, water that is from the tube side, which is the fuel water, and it can go and be part of the boiler feed water. Um, our system is set up that out of the top of the boiler, we produce steam, and the steam can go into your normal distribution systems, or we can produce hot water. We can vary the amount of hydrogen and oxygen and the temperature and pressure inside the boiler to produce steam and hot water at a, at a variety of temperatures and pressures. Uh, let's go with the next slide. So basically, um, we this is a, ren a rendering of our our smaller boiler. It's the DCC 3000. 3000 refers to the number of kilograms of steam per hour we can make. 
or that is the that's the nameplate uh, that we can make. We make another size that's twice that size. It just has about it has twice the heat exchange area, and it's called the DCC six thousand. I'll get into that in a minute. So this uh, boiler is currently being ma being made with our manufacturing partner in Wales, UK, and we have designed this boiler to meet all US, UK, and EU standards. Um, the EU being most of the time the most strict. Um, as you can see, we've designed it for access. We've also designed it so that it can be um, bolted together, top and bottom story, and easily transported either in a TEU on a ship or down, and in addition, down roads without any additional flagging. So um, it's pretty much a bolt together design on a skid mounted system. So let me go ahead with the next slide. These are the three sizes that we're making. We have two in production and one in design. They nominally, for you know, people use a lot of different units. Um, we typically have a, um, they're typically thought of as half meg, one meg and five meg designs. And right there you can see um, what the characteristics of each of those boilers are. And like I said, we, the DCC 3000 is named because we can produce 3000 or our nameplate is 3000 kilograms per hour steam. Uh, depending on what conditions you want, we can go above that or below that, but at 165 degrees C, that is the, um, the rate. And again, the 6,000 is twice that. And then five times that would be the DCC 28K that is currently in design. Um, you can look that over at your leisure. Uh, next slide. So based, oh, I think this is Dean yours. Or is this, oh, I'm sorry, this is still my slide. So, you know, we, we say, um, why would you want to use, if you're putting in energy in and you're putting energy out, why would you want to use a hydrogen boiler? There are several reasons why. Both of them are the greenhouse gas free solutions. Uh, one of the key things that we're finding is at the higher loads and at higher outputs, there's a lot higher demand. There's a higher demand on the voltage and the current for the electric boilers. What, another thing we find when people talk to us about our product potentially versus electric boiler is that they have to take electricity when they need it rather than uh, managing their electricity based on demand charges or time of day pricing. We also, with our hydrogen boiler, we can use an electrolyzer and, um, or we can tank in hydrogen and oxygen and we can location shift or time shift because they're not tied together. The, so the production of hydrogen and oxygen are separate from the use. Um, there are a lot of other reasons. And again, you can read them yourself. One of the other things we find is that we do, the shell side water or what we call the working fluid is something that can be of various purities. It's a standard blowdown system in our boiler. Um, but of course, with an electric boiler, you have to be very careful about purity because of electrode fouling and um, you know, drop in efficiency. So with that, we'll go to the next slide. And here we're comparing um, a hydrogen boiler to a natural gas boiler in a general sort of way. The, um, again, ours is um, emission free. Our 3000 boiler, our DCC 3000 boiler, um, to the right you see under natural gas, produces about uh, 4,000, a little over 4,000 tons of CO and some other things depending on the quality of the gas. Um, also, when you take a look, and Dean is going to get into this more, when you take a look at volatility in the markets or um, predicted direction of cost, you can see that um, natural gas has got a little bit tougher road to hoe than some of the incentivized projects on the hydrogen side. Uh, let's go to the next one. That's Dean. That's Thank me. you. All right. Thanks, Janet. Yeah, and this is this is one of the slides that uh, Jan was talking about. It, we're we're very good with grants, and this one is about the governments around the world um, having incentives for private industry to invest in greenhouse gas solutions. Sometimes a grant is money, and it's dedicated for technology like hydrogen. Sometimes it's to a specific goal, like reducing greenhouse gas. Uh, sometimes it's specific to a match amount, like we'll give you 50-50 matching on government to private money. And sometimes they allow you to stack grants, uh, which you can have multiple funding. So maybe one from a state and one from a Fed, which if you can find those, it probably means the customer is gonna be paying less than 50 cents on a dollar uh, for those kind of programs. 
Uh, Janet and I were really good at uh, winning grants. We'd been winning them for 30 years and we work with our clients uh, to find grants. And our website has a grant interest registration page that helps us align our uh, grant searches with the customer's interests. These grant applications, uh, they take time. They take time to write and you really wanna be ahead of the uh, funding announcement. Um, we'd like to enlist political support, university partners, national labs, um, before the money is released or before the, the FOA is announced. And the reason we do it is it improves our odds of winning. Uh, on this slide, I've highlighted the US Department of Energy's hydrogen earth shot. This one is a nine and a half billion dollar grant announcement, eight billion for hubs, uh, one billion for electrolyzers, and a half billion for manufacturing. The tagline on this one is uh, one, one, one. So a dollar for a kilogram of hydrogen by one decade. And Australia has a similar tag to their country's um, pursuits on their grants, and that's H2 under two. Next slide, please. All right, so the US and Canada, we're not the only two countries investing in hydrogen. There's 90 countries that have committed to net zero. Um, that's 80% of the world's GDP. Mackenzie, who made these two slides, said that the investments in this market are growing at a billion dollars a week. So if we look at the slide or this, the slides on this deck, we see that the governments across the world are racing to make their countries leaders in hydrogen. Uh, the exhibit number two, which is on the right, uh, was done in February last year. The one on the left is July of last year. And the difference between these slots shows us how fast it's moving. In, in February, there was $300 billion allocated towards hydrogen projects in 228 of those size projects. The July left side, we're looking or sorry, 500 billion, half a trillion across 359 projects. So the growth rate over five months is amazing. Um, if we look specifically China, they said that they're gonna put a, a $20 billion in grants towards hydrogen. Um, there's 30 countries that have committed $76 billion towards uh, grant funds. Europe has 130 billion of public private um, projects going now. Uh, and the governments are usually in a matching program where they, they wanna have um, that 50-50 match. And so does our DOE, right? That's nine and a half billion dollars I had on the last slide uh, for Earthshot. That's gonna be $19 billion in public-private projects. And let me note uh, the Hydrogen Council where I got these slides done by McKenzie. They're, they've got great resources. Uh, matter of fact, one of the cool things that I found on the Hydrogen uh, council site was that pipelines for hydrogen are going to be cheaper than transmission lines, electricity transmission lines over long run distances. Next slide. Okay, so how fast are we going to get to this H2 economy? And let's start with the bar, the bar graph on the right. Since 2020, hydrogen production costs have fallen faster than they were predicted. The 2022 study shows that uh, an additional 30 to 50% reduction was found for the electrolyzer capital costs. And that's what the bar is showing us here. That's a supply chain, it's ramping up, project size are increasing and utilization rates are improving. All this money being thrown in is accelerating that, that curve. If we look at exhibit six, which is on the left side, we see a 62% drop in the cost of renewable hydrogen uh, in the prediction from the Hydrogen Council. Now, what's the reason they're putting that arrow there is they're basically saying the economists predict that below $2, uh, hydrogen's competitive with other fuels. And to get there, this slide saying that we need to invest $50 billion, that's US dollars, to build 65 gigawatts of electrolyzers uh, to get us that drop. And if you look closely, you can see a little dashed line at the top on the left, it says 2019 average location. Um, that was the uh, prediction uh, in 2019. And then 2020, just a year later, it was revised down that same uh, point that I talked about in the last slide. 
that it's dropping faster than they were predicting. And these drops are from learning rates, right? I think that's a term we, we learned last decade that the learning rates are um, in, impacted by how much money and time is spent in manufacturing a specific technology. And last decade, you know, we had 2010 to 20, we had batteries, which had a 39% uh, learning curve. Solar was at um, 35 and wind was 19. So with all this capital, next slide, with all this capital going in to this market, the, the curve rates are gonna change uh, even faster. So now that we spent these billions of dollars, we got hydrogen, how are we gonna deliver it? So here's, here's how we're gonna deliver it. Uh, we can truck hydrogen and we can do it liquid or compressed gas. I'm showing two compressed gas transports here, the left and the bottom, um, and one liquid. The liquid guys in the top right and single tanker. So interestingly, that, that liquid tanker, when he pulls up to your shop, he wants to get that liquid out as fast as he can. And what they do is they take the liquid out, they stick it back into the tank, let it expand as gas, and it forces out the other liquid that's in the tank. And it takes a couple hours to, to unload any of these tankers. Um, and the pressure on the, uh, the tube side ones, the left and the bottom, that's high pressure. We're talking 180 bars. 2,600 PSI, and they could move up to 1,000 kilograms in those trucks. Uh, the liquid guy on the top right, that one, he's 4,000 kilograms per truck, and pressure's about 150 PSI. Uh, of course, we at Hydrogen Technologies, we're working with the leading industrial gas suppliers from around the world, right? Lindy's and Air Products and Air Liquide, Cracks Air, TMS. Um, these guys, uh, we're setting up relationships with them to ensure our customers have this kind of relationship. They have to have the long-term supply if they need it, and we wanna have that reliable inbound for the clients. Next. This one's interesting. So here's Japan. Uh, they're investing heavily into doing hydrogen transport. And this is gonna happen from a couple countries, um, but this one's specifically Japan and Australia. So that ship is built by Kawasaki Heavy Industries. It's called Suso Frontier, and that's hydrogen in Japan, Japanese. But it's moving that, that white cylinder you see being loaded is 68,000 kilograms of liquid hydrogen. This ship and the, the processes to load it and unload it, Japanese and Australian venture put in $370 million uh, to do this test. So they're moving it from uh, Hastings, Australia to Kobe, Japan. And that's uh, 9,000 kilometers and it takes 16 days to make the trip. Uh, but they're looking to build 80 of these ships to move 9 million tons of hydrogen every year. Next. All right, here we've got um, storage tanks that you're gonna see uh, at your sites. Um, just examples of storage, right, at a plant. Um, the compressed gas on the two left ones, those are 350 to 700 bars, so 5,000 PSI to 10,000 PSI, that's just gas. Liquid guy on the right, he's at minus 253 Celsius and 155 PSI. And, and a note here is that, um, Mank, we've been using natural or, uh, hydrogen gas for 50 years in the industrial processes, whether we're launching uh, spaceships or using it in ind industry. So the processes are in place. The transport, safety, and storage are all, all in place. So it's a matter of deploying those for our projects. Next. Okay, let's look at politics um, and boiler life. So what we've got here, think about a coal-fired generation station, right? Coal plants are being shut down and we can get assets for the utilities. Um, as Scott mentioned, I'm a board, of me a board of director on our utility, and we had this happen to us last year. An Illinois coal plant was shut down because the state of Illinois decided you're done using that now. And you know the emission laws changed. Uh, New York City, they've got law 97, which puts a carbon tax on emissions in the city of New York, Long Island, at $289, which is really high. Uh, these two counties, Westchester and Tompkins in New York, they put a more, uh, moratorium 
on uh, new natural gas loads. Um, San Francisco, they got a ban on natural gas for space and water heating. Uh, Vancouver is um, residential buildings less than three stories uh, as of this year are banned from natural gas and it will be all buildings by 2050 in BC. Uh, and as we saw earlier, you know, the money being invested by large companies is huge. These companies have influence on government policies and social media is echoing the go green mantra. Um, you know, we used to have leaded gas, uh, we used to have uh, freon arsenic in our treated lumber, lead paint. Uh, EPA was created in 1970 and laws have been changing since. So there's two levers that the government has to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, they could ban the emissions uh, or they could enact financial vehicles um, to incent a specific behavior. Next. So here's one of those behaviors. This is the carbon tax. Um, this is, uh, let's see, Canada in 2022, the carbon tax uh, is gonna be 500% of the national purchase for anybody using natural gas in Canada. By 2030, that carbon tax goes to 660% of the natural gas purchase. And to put that in context, um, the company's annual natural gas OPEX is gonna go up 325% in the next eight years by using that uh, carbon. All right, next. Of course, there's the, the stick and now here's the carrot. Uh, this is the opposite of the tax, this is the credit. Uh, we got carbon credit markets, they're global. Um, and it's a way to monetize your carbon savings. Um, with the DCC 3000, when Janet was talking about, um, you're going to save 4,000 tons of tradable assets, or, or you're going to create uh, 4,000 tons of tradable assets every year. Uh, if we use this graph that's right here, this is the EU's future contract. That would be, if you traded it at 8840, you'd be talking 360,000 euros a year. Um, and if you do it over a decade, you're at 3.6 million euros for that decade of credits. Uh, and, you know, everybody has a different political location, so you may have carbon credits, you may not. Uh, California's got them on that map. Um, and this is just a small example of what's out there in the market today. Uh, worldwide, there's many of them. Next. All right. So here we're looking at a, a common district energy use case. I've got uh, a campus here, and there's a south and a west component that are served by steam heat. Um, the Northeast and North campuses are not. So this is how this customer is looking to dip their toe into hydrogen boilers by de-risking their venture with this, with this process. They would put a boiler, a test, uh, in one hard to decarbonize building, that's STAR, um, sitting in that one campus, and they would get comfortable with it, uh, understand how it's working before they added a second boiler, a third boiler, and moved on to carbon free. So next. This slide um, enumerates our boilers eliminating 160,000 pounds of CO2 emissions every week. And as you add a boiler, you're, you're dropping by another 160,000. Um, these projects, they're gonna be moving forward with grant money and grants are easiest to win when there's few companies submitting the applications. And this happens early on in the technology life cycle. Janet and I can speak from experience. We've been doing it uh, for 30 years that uh, when we guide our customers on the path of these grants, um, you know, see our website and, and understand how to do that registration because it's, it's a process. But uh, as I had mentioned earlier in the previous slide, those electrolyzers are dropping in price. Um, so what we recommend is that you stage these boiler deployments. Uh, you take a cycle, you leverage the market's forces and you manage your risk. So you do a boiler deployment now, uh, do one in uh, 2025, do another one in 2027 and you're ready to be, uh, you're ready for 2030 uh, in this uh, carbon free way. Next. Okay, blending. Um, if you have a, a corporate edict, like somebody, the management or board of directors said, we want to be 
carbon neutral by 2030. Uh, you got to meet your CO2 reduction targets and you need a reliable plan. Um, mixing hydrogen into pipelines is a plan, but is it reliable? Um, and it, when will it work for your facility? Basically, how long will it take the pipeline to service your city gate uh, and take that pipe to 10% hydrogen by volume or 30% or 50%? And even if it made it to 30%, you're only realizing a 10% reduction in your CO2 emissions uh, by burning that gas. Uh, it's not a linear scale. At 50%, you're only getting 25% um, reduction in CO2 emissions. And in our technology, we put 100% hydrogen in and your boiler is commissioned at that point. And reliably, we're going to reduce your carbon emissions by 4,000 tons of CO2 in year number one. Next. Okay. So talking about boiler advantages, uh, we're at 100% hydrogen and oxygen, so we have no atmospheric air in our combustion. Uh, we won't be subject to that carbon tax. Um, you, you could get carbon revenue if you've got a carbon credit market running. We have no forced draft or induction fans, as Janet mentioned, so you don't have to purchase or operate, maintain, or listen to the noise of those fans. No flue gases, no FRG or FGRs. And then uh, without that, as Janet mentioned too, no CO2, SOX, NOx, organic matter, particulate matter, nothing emitted. And of course that means you're reduced emissions testing. You'll still be testing somehow, but without anything coming out, I think it'll be simpler. So we dip your toe into that hydrogen market this way. And it's a, it's a marketing splash for your CEO. Uh, he could put his picture with the boiler in the annual report under your ESG heading and have, and have uh, how you're going green. Next. Oh, questions and answers. All right, back to you, Scott. Thank you for participating with us. Well, uh, thank you, Janet and Dean. That was, you know, obviously this is very exciting technology, including what Hydrogen Technologies Incorporated specifically is doing. Um, we, we, in, indeed, we have uh, a, a lot of questions that have, you know, that have come in. So uh, I, I want to mention to anyone that has submitted a question. Again, number one, you know, we have some potentially extra time we can play with beyond uh, 2 p.m. Eastern. And number two, if because questions and answers can continue to come in during the Q&A that we're about to do. Um, if we don't get to your question, we will get it to the presenters so that hopefully, you know, they might, you know, they potentially can, you know, can get back to you go, um, going forward. Um, we had some great technical questions um, come in. Uh, with that having been said, I, I actually just wanted to start off with, um, uh, you know, with a, with a, you know, a, a very, very sort of basic business question. Does HTI, does Hydrogen Technologies Incorporated have any hydrogen fired hot water boilers that are available for purchase you know in the market right now uh scott that's a good question and what we're doing right now is we're building to spec um we, we have the orders come in and build them in our factory in scotland so we are under the process of constructing and we've got about a six to nine month lead time on those available boilers very, very good i'm going to uh you know, I'm going to kind of go down the list as they came in in chronological um, chronological order. So some of these questions at first might uh, relate to the, you know the opening uh, you know portion of, of of the slides. We had we had a question: What ASME code is applicable for hydrogen boilers? So, um, oh, thanks, Dean. Sorry. Um, so there are several that are applicable, and we use ASME, and we use CE Mark, and we use the UK standard as well. I might have to get our technical guys to answer that very specifically to quote an ASME code, but we have deliberately looked at the most rigorous of all codes and uh, applied to that. And typically it's the EU codes that we follow, but I'd be happy to get that specific answer uh, to that questionnaire. Very good, thank you. Um, you. You may have covered this as another sort of uh, uh, you know, business slash technical question. Um, is the electrolyzer part of the total delivered system? 
I love that question because we are actually working with electrolyzer companies to put together a package. Uh, some of our folks have internal, some of our clients have internal engineering companies or engineering um, departments and want to engineer the, our system, just the boiler into their system. Um, but some say, well, give me the whole package. And so we're not only working with suppliers of hydrogen and oxygen, like, like Dean mentioned, air gas, Praxair, all those folks. Um, but we're also working with electrolyzer companies. And our goal is to have a single skid that will, or two skids mounted together that will have that capability. And you can go right from one to the other. The control system will be integrated. Um, to, right now we're working very diligently with plug and ITM power. Uh, so that's in the works. Very good. I'll preface this question with a statement that, um, that, that was made. The amount of water steam mass flow rate strictly depends on the number of moles of hydrogen and oxygen burned in, closed, in the closed primary circuit. Do you consider additional injection of water steam to the combustion chamber to increase the total mass flow rate of water steam in the primary circuit? We do that, but prime, that we do that. We, we attemperate. But we attemperate basically, basically to control the amount of energy that is produced. Uh, but yes, the, an the answer is yes, but that's not a primary consideration. Um, it is to, um, the flame is five, oh, over 5,000 degrees, 50, 80 degrees, but it is in UV, in UV and UV um, energy. And UV energy has the capability to break bonds, right? And so we attemperate to give ourselves actually a little boost on the fuel side because we're throwing in water there. And it also manages to take that level of superheat down a few notches so that we can get condensation on the tube side. I'd be happy to have that uh, question, the questioner uh, contact me directly and we can get our technical team really get diving into that. Okay, thank you. Um, what is the oxygen to hydrogen rate? Uh, it is on a mass basis, so it is H2O on a molar basis, and it's eight times on a mass basis. So, um, again, that's a, a straightforward calculation on how much hydrogen you put in. You just what you do is you match that with the molar mass, uh, molar flow rate of oxygen going into the burner. Okay. It's stoichiometric. It, you know, it's actually, it's kind of fun to deal with electrolyzer companies because they make hydrogen and oxygen in the exact ratio that we use it. So if you imagine it is they're, they're adding energy to pull it apart. We save it, we manage it, we then use it when it is needed by the customer and we put it back together and then it releases a very similar amount of energy and we capture that uh, in a heat exchanger. So it's, it's, a simple concept, yet managing that energy and managing the UV versus the IR and the burner technology to maximize that conversion or that combustion is where our, our um, art comes in. Okay, and I, it, let me add to that one, Scott. Uh, thanks, Janet. The, the other side of it is the output of our boiler can be input back into that electrolyzer. Right. And that we're, we're doing it, we've got the purest water that exactly what the electrolyzer wants as pure as it can be, and that's what we've got. We created out of hydrogen and oxygen and no air. So we stick it back into the electrolyzer just as we have it on our exhaust, and they want it that way, and they split it back. So we're basically looking closed loop, almost closed loop, um, closed loop cycle. Feels right. right, and and you know, we when we do um, economic analyses for clients, uh, oftentimes the entry point looks like it might be stored hydrogen and oxygen or trucked in or, or shipped in hydrogen and oxygen. But over time, working with electrolyzer companies, a lot of people are in that game and a lot of innovative technologies are coming out. What we've talked to the electrolyzer companies about is collecting the oxygen that's uh, split from water as well. They typically would vent that. But now we have uh, several new designs where we're collecting both the oxygen and the hydrogen, again, in stoichiometric ratio, which, can, which then feeds into our boiler. So it's, it's a nice marriage. Very nice. And, and, and speaking of electrolyzers, here's a question. What is the parasitic load of the electrolyzer? That depends on the electrolyzer. And that's, I'm not an expert there, but certainly we could uh, introduce you to some of the folks that we work closely with. Okay. What pressures or temperatures are the steam rates uh, based on for each DCC size? Okay, so we say in our brochure up to a certain amount, and of course steam 
according to steam tables, has a discrete temperature and pressure. A discrete temperature at a pressure, a discrete pressure at a temperature. And so that's what Dean was referring to. It's a semi-customized system. If you tell us what um, amount of what temperature water you have, um, if it's our atmospheric tank, we'll, we'll give you a certain temperature. If you tell us the pressure, we'll tell you the temperature, vice versa. If you want that higher pressure, like to turn a Siemens turbine or something like that for CHP, uh, then we have uh, pressurized models as well that we can produce a uh, high pressure, high temperature steam. So um, there's a lot of nuance into that question that I understand. It's not one or the other we say up to because that is a customizable feature. Okay, so uh, both, both of you noticed that hydrogen burns very hot. Um, is there any special considerations for water treatment to prevent solids formations on boiler tubes? So if you're talking about the external, so we have, you know, it's a little bit confusing because we have two water systems. We have the fuel water system, which stays in the tube side and does nev it never mixes with the working fluid or the steam that would be produced to send to your distribution system. So on, so on the shell side is where you have the water, your boiler feed water that you introduce. Um, it's again on the shell side. It's what's heated up and sent out as steam or hot water to your facilities. And if the question is, is there a concern about purity of that water? It's again, like a typical boiler, garbage in, garbage out. You know, if we have clean water in there, we'll have to blow down less often, um, but it's a standard, shell and tube heat exchanger, so it's no different than you would get with the natural gas fired system. Um, if you have more pure water, blow down less often. So it's all gonna depend on the quality of the water that you're heating up to make steam or hot water for your, for your distribution. And, and, and let me add to that one, Scott. Um, the hot water coming out of the system, we can do the hot water or steam. And what we saw at the IDEA's last conference for the um, campuses, was the hot water is the next best or the next great thing. Um, and so that's what one of our, our strengths is. We can output hot water, not doesn't have to be steam. So it's it's interesting, again, just to kind of pile on here, it's interesting to talk to clients who make steam and then they put it through a condenser because they really want hot water. Uh, I think a lot of those folks have realized on an energy efficiency basis that that's maybe we don't have to heat it all the way to steam and condense. And so uh, we're working with them on projects of that nature. We had two questions along the same line about you know, the power required for electrolysis. Uh, here's, I'll try to combine them into one question uh, or two. What, what is the electric power requirement for the boiler, including the air separation for uh, oxygen? Okay, so um, the electric, the without, which is our skid, it is standard 460 industrial power. There's nothing there, there's no big fans. There's boiler feed water is about it. Um, a, a boiler feed water pump is about it for electrical demand. The electrical demand comes in in electrolysis. Now, if you don't have electrolysis and you're, you're bringing in hydrogen and oxygen, then you've already asked, answered the question about air separation. We're agnostic. Uh, to where we get our hydrogen and oxygen when folks are bringing it in. Like, like Dean mentioned, we're working on relationships with Air Liquide, Praxair, all those guys. Um, but we don't get into the making of the oxygen itself, except for when it's combined uh, with an electrolyzer. And like I said before, we are working with them to take that oxygen from the electrolyzer instead of venting it and having to bring in oxygen from the atmosphere with an air separator. Um, we are, we're, we're trying to do away with the air separation and, and in an electrolyzer situation, take that directly from the electrolyzer. And, and the um, industrial gas suppliers we're working with are very familiar with delivering just uh, oxygen, straight oxygen yeah. gas. So we can have that delivered in tank, and stored in tank on site too. And, very, and, you know, that, very, very effective. What we've, and what we find is that's very location dependent, you know, like uh, working with some folks in Japan, it's expensive to get stuff delivered there. Mm. Uh, electrolysis on site might make more sense. Other places have some pretty robust delivery systems and, and less expensive gas. So um, it, it's a lot of, you know, I, I get in a lot of trouble for saying it depends all the time, but there are so many variables um, that, you know, we take into consideration to optimize the system that it does yeah. depend. Yeah. Right. In general, for your system, what are the O&M and safety costs like? 
So safety, we we recommend as this, like Dean mentioned, the safety is well known as far as transporting and storing hydrogen and oxygen. We, unlike other systems, we do not pre-mix hydrogen and oxygen. The only time they see each other are inside the um, burner chamber. The other thing we found, so there is not, we have done all the hazards analysis. It has been deemed intrinsically safe, but of course it depends on where you put it in your plant and how, what your local regulations are and your country regulations are. Um, but from a safety standpoint, we're very well aware of the flammability range that hydrogen has and the explosivity that it has. And like I said, we keep it separate and we, we rely on those folks that are, have experience in storage and transportation to do their part. One attendee just wanted to clarify that by, by if I'm interpreting his, his question correctly, by emissions free, that includes carbon monoxide. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah. I think that a really good point is we do not introduce we only have hydrogen and oxygen in there. The only reduct, the only products you're going to get are hydrogen and oxygen products. Um, you know, the, and the most there's O, you know, there's O3, but those quickly go to H2O. That is the most stable, lowest state energy product in that. So we do not introduce air, and typically your nitrogen, your sulfur comes in with, um, well, your sulfur yeah, comes yeah. in with methane. And, meth and this carbon comes in with methane. We don't have any of that in there. Mm -hmm. um, nitrogen typically comes in with your air for combustion and we don't introduce any air. So we don't have that in there. Uh, two, two part question. W what is the combustion slash generation efficiency of pure water? And the second part of the question was, in other words, what is the approximate percentage of pure makeup water needed to feed uh, to an on-site electrolyzer? So what we're saying, we don't know what it is for the electrolyzer. What we're saying, and we allow in our calculations, is about a 1% makeup from the electrolyzer to us, uh, from us returning back to the electrolyzer. So as, you, as we showed you, uh, we create yeah, water. Loop. Yeah, so in that closed loop system, we allow for about a 1% makeup of DI water that goes to the electrolyzer. Once that electrolyzer is charged, and again, depends on size, um, and we're using our system that will only, once we're at steady state, that'll only be a 1% makeup because we will, we will continue to use the water, the hydrogen, oxygen, the electrolyzer makes, we'll make the water to feed the electrolyzer. Is, uh, here's an interesting question. Is there fuel source flexibility with hydrogen from a pipeline versus an on-site electrolyzer? Fuel source, Dean, do you know anything about that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, yeah. That's that's possible. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Matter of fact, that that's one of the questions we got from one of our um, gas partners. Uh, they want to put a, a hydrogen gas pipeline right into our largest offering um, and have a direct feed. So no truck, no storage, just a direct feed from the from the line. Okay. Uh, can compressed natural gas storage tanks be adapted to store hydrogen? I don't know. That's a good question. I don't. I, I don't. I don't know the answer. Um, you know, hydrogen is a highly energetic small molecule. It likes to escape. Uh, the good news is, when it escapes outside, it just goes is part of the air. Of course, it escapes inside. You have some flammability issues to deal with. Um, so I don't know the answer to that question. We all came from oil and gas, though, so we're pretty familiar from with them. Um, you know, carbon-based yeah. products. Yeah. Sure. You've got. Yeah. You have a. a, a, a a lot, a lot of uh, accumulated knowledge uh, as, far, you know, as far as that goes. Mm -hmm. another, but I don't know good, that specific answer. Yeah, yeah. another good question. <clears throat> oh, there's a lot of good questions. Other than the need <laughs> for a flue gas venting system, what is the advantage of your technology over a hydrogen modified boiler, com hydrogen modified boiler combusting hydrogen with ambient air? And as a follow up, if a client already, you know, if a client already has an existing flue gas venting system. Yeah, we hear that a lot. Um, you know, if you look at that curve that Dean showed at the very end there, um, it's just a matter of percent of greenhouse gas emissions that you can achieve. If mm -hmm. you put in air, you're going to get NOx. If you put in carbon-based systems, you're going to get SOx, um, unless you unless you take the sulfur out before, which is a very costly system. So the beauty of our system is is its simplicity because we don't we don't use um, the natural yeah, gas sure. and the blending in there. So we don't have 
we, we can't make we can't make carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide. We can't make nitrous uh, compounds or sulfuric compounds. I don't know. I don't know if that specifically answered the question, but that's kind of a, the world. Yeah. Right. And, and Scott, to put it in numeric terms, if you took our boiler right up against one that was running a mix, um, we would be reducing and, and, and it, it's got air. We're going to be doing 4,000 tons of CO2 emissions reduction every year, and they're going to do 1,000, 25% of what we do if they're running at a 50% hydrogen uh, methane mix. Which, which might be, you know, we know what our burner characteristics are and we know what our burner box has to do because of the high flame temperature, high flame speed of uh, hydrogen and uh, oxidation of hydrogen. We know what that is. Um, again, and the, the special characteristics. I think if you put in 50% hydrogen, you'd really have to look at your metallurgy and your some of your other burner characteristics to go along with that because of the nature of hydrogen. And like Dean said, you still don't get um, a full range of, of NOx, of, I'm sorry, of uh, emissions reduction. Well, we had two questions along um, the, you know, the same line, so I'm gonna try to combine them and, and pose it to you as, as one question. And, and, and the questions have to do with, it seems like a few of our um, attendees were surprised. They, they're saying that when hydrogen is combusted, it does emit nitrogen oxide, does it not? Well, it depends on the quality of the hydrogen. Okay. If, they, if it's pure hydrogen, no, there's no nitrogen in. Okay. Yeah. And about, there's no air. I think they're thinking of air, Scott. Atmospheric. Atmospheric is going to have. Yeah, nitrogen. we don't. That's right. And the key, it's really key that we do not introduce atmospheric air. We it's pure hydrogen and pure oxygen. Okay. Glad, glad, glad you clarified that. Yeah. Uh, hey, Janet. I don't remember. Did you mention we run in a slight vacuum? Oh, uh, we do. Um, that that kind of that we have managed one of our pieces of art is the uh, we run at a slight vacuum which mitigates any hydrogen uh, metallurgy uh, along the embrittlement side. We've had studies done on that, um, so we do run at a slight vacuum, and that um, you know helps yeah. us manage the combustion. Uh, like about a half an inch of water vacuum. It was noted um, by one of our uh, attendees that many urban cities have restrictions on natural gas pressures, including New York City, which restricts which restricts their natural gas pressure to below five psi in most places. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I guess for your systems, you know, given some of these restrictions, what if any safety measures are needed? Yeah, I, I don't know the answer directly. I think that's something we'd have to take a look at. Um, we do that occasionally for clients, take a look at local restrictions, but there are so many um, and they're pretty nuanced. So I don't know the answer to that question. I know that local, it's not only local, it's state, it's provincial, it's country. There are layers and layers of concerns and, and restrictions, whether it be whatever it is, you know, whether it be natural gas or propane or hydrogen, whatever it is. And so that's, that's you know, just part of the part of the equation. Yeah, and, and Scott, we're 150 PSI or so with uh, liquid nitrogen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Have your DCC boilers been installed anywhere beyond a test case yet? And if so, for how long have they been installed? No, we have, um, we have uh, a model up and running that we invite people to come and see. It's probably a tenth the size of our smallest model that's currently being built. You know, there were some supply chain issues, but uh, we have one that will be going into a distillery as soon as it's built. And that will be the first one that's installed in a commercial operation. And one of, you know, I want to point out that one of the reasons there's so much money available for this is uh, that there are the governments and you know, green uh, organizations are really encouraging early adoption. And we're happy to work with anybody on a pilot case, um, a test case. We want, to, you know, we're looking for people that will uh, you know wade into the water with us and give it a try and see how they like it and we'll make it work out can you is another good question can you describe the advantage of your boiler over a fuel cell with heat recovery such as a, a fuel a cogen fuel cell electric generation and steam or hot water well fuel cells are used to make electricity 
and we're not making electricity as our primary product, we're making steam. And so I think that's pri the primary difference between us and this fuel, fuel cell. Um, you know, we like fuel cells. Uh, we're not competing with fuel cells. There are really good applications for fuel cells. There are other applications for us. We're not trying to be one size fits all. Um, we can, you know, we don't make electricity. We make steam or hot water. And that steam can be used to turn a steam turbine and create power. Um, and I think that would be the closest thing to comparing it to a fuel cell that creates what? Electricity, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, but that's our, that's not our best use. A power to power uh, play is not our best use. Plow power to combine heat and power is a better use of our technology, but a straight steam um, for district heat, for chemical processes, um, there's so many chemical processes. One of the things that we learned going through all of this is actually when they were doing due diligence on the company that I started and came over with was um, that 37 percent of greenhouse gas emissions uh, in the industrial sector come from boilers and so that's a, that's a huge amount mm -hmm. so it is used it is ubiquitous i mean pulp and paper cosmetics textiles you name it food processing is huge it's it's everywhere and uh you know we're not always the right application but very often we are a contender right and and, and that's scott that's the uh, problem domain we're trying to solve really is our, our targets the thermal the thermal energy domain that problem is where we're, we're targeting what is the uh speaking of power what is the electric power requirement for the boiler including the power for the air separation unit well you asked that one yeah 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 we don't have an air separator it's, okay yeah yep. yeah I, I think we already I think we already answered it. If, you, if not. You, you, you indeed, I, I think you indeed may have. And, and let me just say this about sort of the you know the questions and whatnot because it looks like we're coming up on five of two. Um, first of all, during the presentation as well as during the Q and A, we have uh, received in our Q and A box eighty questions, uh, not including a few that may have ended up in the chat box. So the you know we've received a ton of questions, many of them great great questions. A, if you both of you are willing, um, you know, we will take this to 20 past the hour if, if that works for you, because obviously the interest in you know, what you're doing and hydrogen in general is very, very high. I'll also mention to the questioners that just because of the time limitation, we won't be able to get to all of the questions, but it is our intention at IDEA to get those to you know, Janet and Dean you know, um, going forward. So I just wanted to mention that, uh, you know, again, as, if, if uh, Dan and Dean, if you're willing to go over time for 20 minutes, we can definitely um, keep going. I, I think 20 minutes works. Sure. I, I mean, we're really excited about this and we'd love to answer questions. Yeah, so, that's ha true. Happy to, happy to do that. Terri uh, uh, terrific. Um, a, a question from another uh, uh, that I, uh, person that I thought was very interesting. What is your opinion on the role of turquoise hydrogen using pyrolysis moving forward as opposed to renewable you know, electrolysis. All right, that's a Dean question. <laughs> I was hoping that's a Janet question. <laughs> well, from the perspective of where the customers are going, Scott, um, and question asker, it's really a matter of how many stages away do they want to be green, right? It, if you create the, the hydrogen and oxygen on your facility and you're using electricity, where's the electricity coming from? Is it coming from a coal plant? Is it coming from a nuclear plant? Is it coming from a solar array, a wind turbine? Um, that's really the uh, up to the customer. For us, it's not so important as long as we're able to have the hydrogen gas and oxygen to the boiler. Um, the background of that's, that creation is not so important to us. Um, it may be to the customer, but for us, it's it's a matter of a fuel. You know, and as far as pyrolysis, et cetera, goes, I think it's gonna take all of the above. Mm -hmm. uh, we are not like, oh, it's gotta be green, green, green from the start, like Dean was saying. We need to do what we can now and continue to move forward. Right, and, and, and we're, I guess the other point of that is we're helping create the hydrogen economy demand. Right, there's a lot of money being spent on supply, transportation, uh, creation, um, automotive vehicle. 
but we're hitting, as Janet said, that load that creates 37% of the greenhouse gases from industry. Um, and that's our, our forte. So we're going after that piece of the equation um, and we can solve it at the 100% zero emissions from the beginning. Yeah. Do you have, well, I'll, I'll mention this. I, I won't say them, I, I won't announce these, these questions, but I will tell you that we have at least one um, you know, attendee who you even mentioned about pricing estimates or existing case studies or whatnot. We will, Jan and Dean, we will con you know, connect you, uh, you know, with you offline or, or, you know, or, or whatnot. Yeah. I wanted to try to you know, hearten you by the fact that you know we, we do have questions about you know pricing and things like that, which I'm sure you um, which I'm sure you appreciate. We yes. did have a technical question: is is a retrofit uh, or it what retrofits for boilers uh, you know m you know might be necessary for your equipment or um, is it not too too much of a concern? I don't, I, you know, I think by the time we've taken a look at that, I think by the time you retrofit it all, you're almost better getting a new boiler. Um, it depends on how old your boiler is. I mean, if you've got a, you made an investment two years ago, that's a different story than if you made an investment, you know, 25 years ago. Right. Um, uh, and I, I know, so we, I, I believe it's possible to retrofit. Um, again, it, ours is much simpler, so you would not need, um, the fans and the flues and all that kind of stuff. And you would have to replace the burner configuration that's there with the one we have. Of course, mm -hmm. the heat exchanger uh, surface area would have to, you know, be verified. And But, you know, it's it's basic metal and it's basic heat transfer. So I think there's some opportunities. Right. And, and Scott, some of the times we're talking to people, Janet mentioned uh, how old is the boiler? We've been mm -hmm. on calls where where everybody on the call is younger than the boiler we're talking about <laughs> replacing. And younger than us. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe just barely, but- uh, Barely, I'll, I'll just barely. I'll take your word, yeah, your word for that. Um, we had a question regarding the, uh, the, the water that comes from the tube side. What temperature does it exit the boiler? And I think that um, person's question, you know, maybe they were, uh, they may have been thinking about, you know, oh, you know, could we do heat recoveries you know, uh, yeah, from the yeah. gas um, along those lines? Yeah, I mean, our goal uh, is to have complete condensation, but we don't have complete condensation. We have an, uh, right now we have a small after heat exchanger. So it's pretty much saturated water at whatever uh, saturated, I mean, it's water and saturated steam at whatever temperature, whatever pressure it is. So, um, um, it could, pr it could pr it pretty much comes out at just under steam overall, just under steam temperature at atmospheric pressure. So just under 200 degrees. And, and interestingly, to that point, some of the electrolyzer research and development going into the marketplace today, right? Remember I said there was a billion dollars going towards it just from our government, is for high temperature water input into the electrolyzers. So as those things mature and those things become more prevalent and better, faster, cheaper, that's, we're a great fit for that, even a better fit. So that's a, another thing that we've got going. It is another interesting question. Um, how available potentially are electrolyzers that use renewable electricity, whether it's you know, solar PV, wind, or even nuclear, uh, that would be able to generate hydrogen and oxygen. Let me take that, Dean. Sure. Well, so I think that the electrolyzer companies we work with, and I want them to speak for themselves. You know, I'm not going to speak for for Plug or ITM or some Mel. Um, uh, you know, they they are trying to go as green as they can and and put in and make their electricity not off the grid, but in a separate. A renewable farm, if you will, they're successful to a certain degree or not, depending on the location and the availability of, you know, the infrastructure there. So I don't mm -hmm. really know the answer to that question. But what I do know is that 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 um, there's a lot of effort being done in the electrolyzer world to bring that uh, the cost down as well as that requirement down. So I don't yeah. know where it's going to be. We had uh, you know, at least you know, two, two questions that I'm gonna sort of try to combine. They regard efficiency. Um, so one of them was, and they might be related. One of them was, you know, what is the boiler efficiency? The other was whether 
HTI has an efficiency curve that shows electrical usage versus uh, MBTU heat supplied. So the first one, what's the efficiency? We are running, um, when we have this uh, final, we've got the final design, when it's fully developed, we're gonna run a bunch of efficiency tests. Right now, we're just looking at the U value of heat exchange and then some, uh, just some basic heat losses. So I think we're talking, uh, we think that we're gonna be in the 95 to 97% range on the boiler now. The electrolyzer, if you have an electrolyzer and not bringing in compressed gas or hydrogen and oxygen, if you're using an electrolyzer, they're, they're touting something in the high 70s, low 80s, uh, with a target of mid 80s. So you would have to combine that together and the overall efficiency would probably be, I'm guessing about low 80s combined um, at this time. Well, but a lot, like I said, a lot of efforts going into the electrolyzer uh, effort. And efficient. if you're connected, if you're connected right to a uh, hydrogen that right. gas pipeline, then you've got a different efficiency equation. Right. So that, but that's a key concern of ours: efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. It's all about that, and making sure we combust all the hydrogen. We're not wasting fuel. You know, all that stuff is, um, right. you know, is part of our development process. You know, we are in a very robust uh, development state. So uh, mm -hmm. these questions are really good because it it tickles my mind to say, oh yeah, 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 we want to make sure we're addressing that. So I do appreciate these questions. Uh, they lead us to better product and I appreciate it. What, uh, is there a certain pipe material, when it comes to um, hydrogen pipelines, is there a certain pipe material that you recommend or have found optimal? I don't know. I don't work on the pipeline side, so yeah. I, don't, I, can't, I couldn't speak to that well. We'll, we'll let the pipeline guys uh, yeah, take Yeah, the pipeline, that. they're experts, yeah. And we look to them. What is the suitability of, uh, of, of boilers if, if they're trying to move from a mix of hydrogen and gas blends to 100% hydrogen? The suitability of our boiler to do that? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I wanna answer the right question here. I'm not sure I understand completely. Yeah, we, 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 uh, you're right. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to rephrase the question. We'll actually you know, skip that one. We'll, you know, we'll get it to okay. you. Uh, Okay. Uh, going forward, um, boy, if you want to get into the financials, we got to ask a question. It's a good question, but I don't know if we can answer it. You know, right now. Uh, well, the, we would probably make you sign an NDA before we'd answer that question. Well, well when I said, it, uh, it, I'll admit, it, it, it was about, to talk about it. It, it was about you know, capex and opex for these systems versus traditional natural gas boilers. So I don't know yeah. to put you on the spot for anything specific. Just you know, very much in you know, in general, if someone out there is trying to make yeah. a financial case. It, it, well, I, I, I'm going to say it is not at this point, 2022, they're not comparable. We're mm -hmm. just expensive. I mean, the hydrogen's got to get down in that one graph I was showing you, we got to get down to less than two bucks um, to be competitive. And what's happening, Scott, is as we're coming down in price, mm -hmm. natural gas is probably going to stay fairly flat. I don't think it'll go up much because the usage is going to come down, but we're still producing a lot. We're still fracking it. Um, but the carbon taxes are going up. And so as time goes on, the carbon tax levies coming up, um, the hydrogen gas is coming down, and eventually there's going to be a crossing, right? All those um, metrics that we're looking at, and I was, I was giving you guys a uh, an idea of crossing at $2 makes it competitive. There's another one that says what happens when natural gas uh, taxes uh, inflate the bottom of that scale. So it's a really tough thing to say, but today it's mm -hmm. absolutely certain we're expensive. I mean, to, to run us against the natural gas, we're expensive. Yep. Well, we're not that much more expensive. We are more expensive, but yep. it's not a 10x. It's more of a like a no, 2x, right. potentially a 2x. And That's all. Right. It's not a 10x. And once um, you drop in those dropping grants now you're bringing it down even more right mm -hmm. so if you happen to have one yeah. of these grants that cut your your cost in half then we're playing in a reasonable place so it's, it's the other thing that we're seeing and hearing about is some locations are you know uh, ahead of others are outlying emissions of any kind or they're they're not going to permit any more natural gas boilers or different types of things and so mm -hmm. what we're finding is that stranded asset concept of now what do we do? Our boiler is a 25 year life and it's seven years old or 11 or two right. years old. What are we gonna do with that asset? And so that's, 
this is when people make this decision, whether they're retrofitting or whether they're buying a new boiler, it's a 35 year decision. And what do you think 35 years is going to look like from now? How do you think that's going to be? You know, we don't have a crystal ball, but we certainly see some trends in the near term and the midterm. Um, and that's, uh, that's a case in point to, to what we're doing with coal plants today. We're, we're shutting them down. They're not, they're not fully depreciated um, and they're still assets on the books. And I think boilers are going to be similar. Natural gas in general, 10 years, 20 years out is going to be similar. Yeah. Janet, Dean, you, you, you mentioned that the, at least one of your you know, boilers has been installed. I, I, I don't know if that, you know, if that can be called a demonstration unit since it's actually an operation, but we, we had a question come in that, you know, wh where is the demonstration unit located and, you know, and, and essentially can it be looked at by other people? Yes, we would love to invite those folks that are interested. It is located in Modesto, California, Central Valley of California, and we um, have it all, you know, we've got a nice setup now for you can even stream back to your home home base, um, the, the tests that you're witnessing. We're happy to provide a demonstration uh, in real time and stream back, or, or we plan to make a demonstration without a client there and, and have that available for people to look at. That'll be probably available in the next two or three months, but we're happy to ha host you out in Modesto. Right. What are the typical hydrogen either kilograms or kilowatts per hour and oxygen kilograms, kilowatts per hour for the electrolyzer that you're using? Oh, the output? Maybe that's yeah. what they're asking. Let, let, let's say, yeah, let, 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 let's, yeah. let's, for the sake of argument, let's say for the output. Yeah. And uh, I don't know what the output rates are. Do you, Janet? Um, I mean, they're matching. They're matching. I mean, we match we use. match them to what we need on an input level. They have so you know it has electrolyzers are built in stacks, and so um, if they if our client wants a particular output from our boiler, and we that requires a particular input to our boiler and fuel, and what we try to do is match that with the stacking of electrolyzer. Um, I don't know what they're called electrolyzer uh, stacks. You know they have. Right. Uh, to it's, it's usually two to four, um, and yeah. require. So, so about 130 pounds of hydrogen an hour would be coming out of the stacked uh, electrolyzer, and yeah. for oxygen, you're looking at a uh, thousand pounds. And again, whether you use a PEM electrolyzer or an alkaline electrolyzer depends on whether you want a fast ramp up and ramp down, or you want more, mm -hmm. uh, or you plan to use it more as a base load, um, because the the alkaline electrolyzers are significantly less expensive, but they're not as responsive as the PEMs. But again, there are, there's a lot of activity in that area to bring both of them to you know, higher responsiveness and lower cost. We had a, a, a number of people who were intrigued enough by what they have heard today, you know, pose questions about, boy, you know, can, can this be used in residential settings? Can it, can it be used to heat individual buildings? Do you have any, you know, that, that might not be the market that specifically Hydrogen Technologies Incorporated is after, but do you have any thoughts about, you know, in, you know, in the years to come, whether the use of this type of technology, you know, could, 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 could be used for other things than what you're working on right now? Absolutely. And matter of fact, the, the single building question that they posed in there is one of the things that we think is a great play for the district energy people looking to put their toe into the water, right? You've got one building called a gym and you want to test this kind of technology. We'll put this thing for that one building. Um, and eventually will it be smaller units? Sure. That's, that's uh, a clear path for the entity to, to move from. Here's another technical question. What type of ramp rates, for example, percentage of the you know, MCR minimum is achievable with this type of boiler and what is the minimum turndown? So um, that's one of the things we're gonna be testing right now to be, in, to be prudent. We're saying turndown is 50% is what number we're giving. Um, our preliminary simulations and our initial design looks like closer to 20%. Um, that we can, but we don't want to, we want to uh, under promise and over deliver. So from a ramp rate and ramp rate um, from a cold start, it's probably about an hour, hour and a half on the, the unit from a warm start is pretty, pretty quick. 
maybe five minutes, 10 minutes to come up to temperature. Would the electrolyzer pairing not include storage so that you could generate hydrogen during off peak? Mm -hmm. You know, actually we have a project like that. We have a project, um, the, 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 um, the distillery that we're talking about. They've undersized the electrolyzer and they're gonna run it 24 seven. They're gonna store the hydrogen, oxygen, and then run our DCC as a batch process to make gin. So um, I don't know if that, that doesn't necessarily answer your question, but there will be, there will always in any process is gonna be you know, a wide spot in the line for startup, shutdown, uh, upset, and all that kind of stuff. And it would depend on what specifically you wanted to do, but certainly storage between electrolyzer and DCC is, is going to happen. The size of that storage is gonna depend on how you wanna use it. Right, and that, that's a, also along the time shift that Janet had mentioned earlier. Yeah generate that uh, that hydrogen and oxygen over the night hours and then you during the day when your electricity rates are spiking you got a peak super peak turn off your electrolyzer and just use your stored unit gases to, to run so that your steam's constant and your electro your electrolyzer is uh, moving with the cheap electricity so for, as an example we were in california and they have cal iso and we went on the website to see what cal iso was selling power for and it was a negative amount of money because they have an oversubscription of um, renewables. The idea there is then you run your electrolyzer during those times of essentially free energy, electricity, store hydrogen and oxygen, and their peak rates are in upwards, you know, 65 cents a kilowatt hour. You run those at that time. But that's what makes us separate from an uh, um, electric boiler because the electric boiler, you have to run uh, the electricity at the time you need the steam. With us, we can separate the two. Okay. Thank you. Uh, it, it is now about 2.16 uh, uh, p.m. Uh, e Eastern. And while we had almost one, you know, 100 questions come in, time doesn't allow us to get to all of them. But I want to thank all the attendees for submitting you know, some great, great questions. There's yeah, great questions. You know, tremendous in interest here. I certainly want to um, remind the audience that whether they are joining us in Toronto live or you know, even if you can't do that, um, perhaps being virtual attendees of the conference, which I certainly recommend. I know Dean is going to be doing a presentation at that, that conference. So that is uh, you know, just one more in the uh, many you know, lists of reasons to either attend our conference or be a, you know, a virtual uh, participant. Um, I, I, certainly, I wanna thank both uh, you know, Janet and Dean of Hydrogen Technologies Incorporated for, you know, for, their, um, for, their, you know, for their presentation today. It's very, very interesting. I would be remiss if I did not uh, you know, mention that the next in the series of IDEA's Insights and Innovations webinar is uh, next, it's next month, it's Wednesday, June 22nd, again at 1 p.m. Eastern, when our friends from Plexum America, Americas are going to be talking about thermal energy, BYU metering with clamp-on uh, ultrasonic meters. Um, and certainly if, if anyone in the uh, you know, audience who it, it works for a company that is interested in doing one of these such uh, webinars as Janet and Dean did very expertly today. Please contact my, my colleague Tanya Kozell at tanya.idea at districtenergy.org or at the, uh, at the phone number below. But again, my sincere thanks to Janet and Dean and Hydrogen Te Technologies for enlightening us all on, you know, on this great technology that they are working on. And you know, really, I, I think in the, you know, going forward, you know, in the very near future, are gonna be a tremendous asset to district energy systems, including uh, you know, a lot of them that the folks on the call uh, you know, work for. So, uh, please accept my uh, you know sincere thanks for coming right up on our 220 cap. I really appreciate both of your you know going you know over overtime with this. So again, we look forward to um seeing you know uh, many of you who are on the call. We look forward to seeing you in Toronto at the IDEA's um, 113th annual uh, you know, conference. You can still register for that for either the in-person uh, show or, you know, or or virtually. So with that, I think we will sign off, and we're looking forward to seeing everyone. Uh, you know, again, either at the Toronto show or next month at our uh, next INI webinar. Thanks again. Thank Katie. you all. Thank, Thank you. you as well. Appreciate everybody attending. Yep. Thanks. Thanks. Have a great afternoon. Really appreciate it. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.